We'll get started in just a moment. <coughs> Good afternoon. I'm Adam Lupel, IPI Vice President, and it is my honor to welcome you to this speaker series event, a conversation with His Excellency, Mr. Shahidul Haq, Foreign Secretary of Bangladesh, on new developments in the Rohingya humanitarian crisis. We are indeed happy to welcome back Mr. Haq, who last spoke at IPI on the crisis a little over a year ago in February of 2018. Some of you may have been with us that day. At the time, he expressed the strong commitment of his government to accommodate the more than one million Rohingya who had crossed the border from Myanmar into Bangladesh in a remarkably short period of time, presenting great challenges and high risks for the refugees, the local communities, the government, uh, and the surrounding natural environment. Myanmar and Bangladesh agreed to a procedural framework for the repatriation of the refugees as early as November of that year, 2017. But increased instability in northern Rakhine state, among many other factors, demonstrates that the conditions are not favorable for return and regrettably are unlikely to be so soon. Indeed, earlier this month, the ICRC had to suspend much of its activities in northern Rakhine state due to uh, fighting between the Myanmar armed forces and the insurgent Arakan army. A January attack by the Arakan army at four locations near the Bangladesh border killed 13 police officers. Continuing instability in Rakhine state leads to the dual question. One, how to resolve the crisis to create the conditions for return, and two, in the meanwhile, how best to provide for the well-being of the refugees while also mitigating the long-term impact of refugees on host communities. In her briefing to the Council yesterday, UN Special Envoy for Myanmar, Christine Schreiner Bergener, reported that the refugees in Cox Bazar, Bangladesh, find themselves in, quote, extremely challenging temporary conditions. She complimented the generosity of Bangladesh and the host communities, but she emphasized a rising recognition that current conditions cannot be expected to continue indefinitely. Thus, her office's priorities include ending the violence improving humanitarian access, addressing the root causes of the crisis, and promoting inclusive and equitable development in Myanmar. Of course, this all takes time. And so, regrettably, the long-term needs of the humanitarian crisis must be met. In that regard, the Special Envoy called for the urgent need for funding for the UN Joint Response Plan for the Rohingya Crisis. And all of this, presents great challenges for neighboring Bangladesh. Thus, we are very fortunate to have Secretary Haq back here to speak to us again about these issues of pressing international concern. Mr. Haq has been serving as Foreign Secretary of Bangladesh since January 2013. Prior to assuming this post, he occupied several senior positions at the International Organization for Over Migration, IOM, and from 2010 to 2012, he served as director of IOM with responsibility for its international migration policy. 
More recently, Secretary Haack has served as chair of the ninth Global Forum on Migration and Development and is currently serving his second elected term as an independent expert to the UN Committee on the Rights of All Migrant Workers and Members of Their Families. Most importantly for our current discussion, he is presently heading the Bangladesh National Task Force on Forcibly Displaced Myanmar Nationals and representing Bangladesh on the Joint Working Group with Myanmar on Repatriation. And uh, yesterday, he delivered Bangladesh's statement to the Security Council session on the situation in Myanmar. Given this extensive experience and knowledge, Mr. Haq is ideally situated to provide us with the view from the region of the current crisis. Um, Mr. Haq will speak for 15 to 20 minutes, and then we will come back uh, and sit here. We'll have a couple questions for the secretary, and then we'll open the floor for Q&A. We should have plenty of time for that. With that, welcome back, uh, Mr. Secretary. The floor is yours. I brought all the books in case uh, I need to go back uh, to, uh, to clarify certain things that I'm expected from the crowd. Um, thank you very much. Uh, and it's always good to be uh, back in New York and uh, in particular the IPI uh, uh, to uh, be able to freely share uh, views and opinions. Uh, before I speak, uh, I, I, I feel that I should be frank and open unlike a civil servant, uh, and I'll, uh, I hope that uh, you will also reciprocate that sentiment. Otherwise, it will be quite a sterile discussion, which will be no use to anyone. Uh, uh, I'm sure that by now you are uh, quite aware of the situation centering around Rohingyas. Uh, I myself have spoken here, and I'm sure there are other speakers. So. Uh, uh, what I'll do, uh, I will uh, quickly run through the, uh, the slides to give you a, a little bit of a contemporary status of the, of the situation. And then I'll take question and answer, which should be much more uh, uh, interesting. Now, as uh, uh, we have all, you know, certain conducive environment for the Rohingyas to be able to go back. So uh, as of now, we have not seen any sign of compliance uh, on the part of Mi uh, Myanmar government uh, with this. So return remains uh, uh, something which is, uh, which is not possible. Now, we have also seen uh, during this phase of the, uh, of the phenomena that uh, Myanmar has been, um, has been provocating Bangladesh in many ways. In the way uh, I uh, interpret that uh, there has been an attempt to uh, make uh, the whole issue uh, from, a, from a humanitarian crisis to military conflict between Myanmar and, and Bangladesh. Uh, you must have also hear that, uh, uh, that this is something between Bangladesh and Myanmar. Let me tell you, this is nothing to do with Bangladesh and Myanmar. We never had a conflict. This is no, uh, there is no outstanding issue between Bangladesh and Myanmar. We are very good neighbor. We have a very good diplomatic relations. This is something between Myanmar and its old nationals called Rohingyas. This is all about, and we are happens to be uh, uh, next uh, to uh, these people where they have taken shelter. So that's how we, got ourselves engaged. So it is not an interstate fight, it's an ethnic issue, which I'll come back later. This is the uh, famous uh, uh, boundaries between Bangladesh and Myanmar. The reason I'm showing this map, that uh, lately we realized that Myanmar started uh, showing part of Bangladesh as part of Myanmar, globally. We have brought this to the 
notice of uh, UN, uh, and uh, they corrected it. And then uh, after a week, they again show that uh, you, if you click uh, uh, on, onto, the, onto the web, you will see that this is part of a, 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 a part of Myanmar, whereas uh, uh, we have settled maritime boundaries through international arbitration long time back. In particular, the place they would like show, to show it theirs is the San Martin Islands, and which has been to, uh, which has been a Bangladesh territory. I don't know how for how long. Um, so uh, this is one. The other one is uh, which uh, uh, our moderators have rightly pointed out that there has been sporadic conflict between. Uh, Tatmadu is the military uh, known as, and uh, uh, other ethnic groups uh, who uh, live along Bangladesh Myanmar border, like in the Shin state and other states uh, of, uh, of Myanmar. Recently, there has been a fight between Arakan army and, uh, uh, and uh, Myanmar military, which has led to again an outflow of. Uh, Buddhist Rakhine into Bangladesh. So that's the new manifestation of, uh, of an old crisis. So what are the options that we have uh, currently? Uh, one is that uh, uh, we have been emphasizing, especially in our bilateral arrangements and the multilateral discussions, that let's get the Kofi Annan Commission report implemented. Let's start the implementation. If you ask them, they will say it has been implemented already. So in my uh, Security Council, a statement yesterday, I said that if that is so, things would have been grossly and vastly improved on the ground, and that's not the case. Number two, uh, you know, uh, it is now clear that uh, atrocities have been committed by uh, Myanmar authorities against uh, uh, Rohingyas, and that has to be addressed. Without having that, uh, I think this time around, the Rohingyas are unlikely to go back. And if you talk to some of the Rohingyas, which we do often, uh, I've been going to this uh, Rohingya camps for the last 22 years. Uh, you know, we started off our career with the Rohingya problem, it seems. And we are ending up the career with, <laughs> with the same, same problem. Uh, so they say that uh, this is my third or fourth time, especially the elder people, they have gone back with the hope that they'll be able to make a new life and again returned and again went back and again return on both the occasion with the help of UNHCR and other agencies. So this time they said, where, where is the hope that this time will not be again uh, abused, killed, raped, tortured, and sent back to Bangladesh? So this is where we are uh, facing a, a tremendous amount of questions. So in order to uh, uh, address this, our prime minister uh, in nine, 2017 floated an idea of, uh, uh, of, of, uh, of safe zone. I'll not elaborate here. If there are questions, I'll come back to this. Now, this is what the whole uh, uh, civilian-run safe zone concept is. Uh, uh, all civilians, irrespective of uh, religion and ethnicity, must be protected in Myanmar, is the prime minister saying uh, in the 72nd sessions. And uh, uh, for that, safe zone could be created inside Myanmar under UN supervision. Supervisions. If there are questions, we'll try and explain it. We, it will be civilian in nature. That's what we are saying. Uh, at least at this stage, we are not thinking this to becoming a peacekeeping operations <laughs> monitored by the peace uh, by, by the peacekeepers. Uh, we are also thinking, since there is a discussion within ASEAN uh, to resolve this issue peacefully. So we are asking for an ASEAN role as well. Now, you know, so far you must have noticed I was talking of returns, but uh, uh, that has remained uh, the policy of, of Bangladesh for quite some time. But this time around, we realized that unless you bring in the whole issue of accountability of justice, you cannot permanently resolve this problem. You cannot make sure that next time there won't be another exodus. In order to do that, we have to look at accountability and justice, and that's why Myanmar governments seems to be not very happy that Bangladesh on one hand talking about the bilateral and on the other hand they are, uh, uh, they are uh, talking about accountability and justice where I'll take five minutes of yours seeing as to how Bangladesh is looking at it. Now there are a couple of places where uh, we have opened windows. We means uh, uh, some of our civil society, international civil society 
and some of the institutions that I'll be talking about. One is the ICC. Uh, ICC, Myanmar is not a party to ICC. Bangladesh is a party to ICC. Eh? And, uh, uh, and we, and, and then, and uh, last year when ICC approached us formally uh, uh, to um, ascertain whether Bangladesh agrees ICC to have a jurisdiction on the uh, Rohingyas who are in Bangladesh, uh, we uh, uh, submitted a 33-page uh, document uh, showing how our domestic law and our uh, understanding of international law uh, is in line with ICC coming in with its jurisdiction. So now that the jurisdiction has been established, ICC will be making its first official visit, uh, what they call preliminary examination um, phase that will be coming, uh, I think, in two days' time, uh, a huge team. So that's one stream that currently we see in, in, in the making. The other one is the whole uh, uh, ongoing independent mechanism, some of you know, across this road, um, the UNGA has adopted a resolution uh, setting a, a process almost like the Syrian IIIM process, uh, which is currently uh, looking at various provisions. And the third is the uh, OIC, uh, Organization of Islam Islamic uh, Conference. Uh, they have uh, uh, floated uh, an idea or set up an ad hoc working group on accountability. The first time, OIC has never done these kinds of things ever in the past. So when they were having the foreign ministers meeting last year in Dhaka, Gambia and Bangladesh jointly made a proposal uh, and uh, it was adopted. Uh, last week uh, in Gambia, there was an ad hoc working group meeting where they uh, agreed after two days of deliberations because for OIC, this is something absolutely new. Uh, so they decided that they will uh, have a path toward ICJ, not ICC. So what it suggests is that uh, there are multiple paths uh, we are uh, trying to encourage the international community to look at in terms of bringing the whole issue of accountability and justice. Which one will eventually uh, be successful, we will have to wait and see. So this is a major uh, uh, departure, if you ask me, in terms of our foreign policy also. Uh, I will not go into detail, these are, I've already done, done it. Uh, I, I think uh, uh, this is something very important. Eh? And this is important because we have learned in a very hard way. As some of you know that in 1971, uh, we had uh, uh, a war of liberation against uh, a particular country of our, our neighbor. Uh, and then uh, there were also uh, we believe the genocide committed, but uh, in those days there was not much of a CNN, BBC uh, or Channel 4. Uh, we were also uh, not very equipped uh, and we did not keep any evidence, uh, almost no. Uh, whatever is there uh, is, 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 uh, uh, is very little, except a few internationals kept some of the evidence of genocide that was committed against us. I was hardly eight years old and I still remember uh, uh, porn full of dead bodies. That's what my uh, evidence is. If some, sometime I asked to go and tell that I said, I remember that I've seen uh, porn full of dead bodies of people who shouldn't be there to start with. So <clears throat> this time we also realized that evidence has to be uh, gathered, collected and kept. So right from uh, day one, uh, we have uh, welcomed uh, international uh, bodies who collect, preserve, evidences, especially from uh, United States. There was a large number of uh, uh, experts went along. People, people do not know. Uh, this was done very quietly. Uh, and, and now uh, UN bodies are also collecting evidence and, uh, mm -hmm. and we'll see how, how these becomes useful. So these are the, some of the, uh, uh, some of the uh, entities which are involved in collecting evidences, including our own one, learning from our own 1971. We have set up a center for genocide studies in Dhaka University. I don't know whether you know, if you go, they will walk you through the trail of genocide in the Dhaka University, which was the center of atrocities in 1971. <clears throat> so, and then ICC, IIII, uh, and the uh, other processes. Now, uh, what are the challenges? Uh, it looks like that we have been uh, made scapegoat uh, in the process. I'll tell you why. Myanmar goes around 
circulating note verbals, very official documents, saying that Bangladesh wants to keep the Rohingyas because they want to make business out of it. Ha, huh, of course. Because their presence has pulled down our uh, GDP by 1%. So how, 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 where is the business that we, we, we made? Uh, and, uh, and, and they also blame uh, Bangladesh for sheltering uh, so-called uh, terrorists uh, uh, in, the, in the camp. And they think the camp is basically a, is a, is a terrorist training uh, and harboring camps. Of course, please come and see three years old child are all part of the uh, terrorist network. So, so you know, uh, uh, that is why uh, I said what needs to be said in this Security Council yesterday uh, uh, in a very clear terms uh, uh, that uh, we have no business with the terrorists. Um, uh, in, in fact, uh, last year we got a list of uh, 735 people uh, saying, and Myanmar keeps on saying it, say that these are the terrorist list, we are giving it to you, they are all in the camp, get hold of them, either try them or hand it over to us. And, and while we were looking at, uh, uh, at the list, we realized there are as young as three years old kid in the list. So that's the big question, that how three years old kid could be a possible terrorist. Maybe parents are. Um, and, and Myanmar absolutely disregards uh, the root causes. They think taking away their passport to start with in 1982, taking away their white card in 91 and 92, taking away all kinds of identity card in, in beginning 2000 is not the cause of the exodus. That's not the root cause. The root cause is they are Muslim. They only study Quran. Uh, and, uh, and they don't know how the world runs. So that is the root cause, strangely enough. So, an absolute disrespect to the international norms and principles. Uh, and I'll tell you, someone who has been uh, uh, dealing, negotiating with them for the last uh, seven years, absolutely frustrating experience. Absolutely. And I can tell you that I'm someone who uh, used to having these kinds of a negotiation in my earlier career with difficult partners. Uh, across the world, I've been posted in Afghanistan, I have been posted in Yemen, I have been posted in other places where I have dealt with uh, similar situations. Okay? And if you make a promise, you make a promise. You keep it. Unless there's something grossly wrong with, which forces you to, uh, uh, to break the promise. Uh, so my question is, is there an end game that we are looking at? And what is that end game? I've also said in the Security Council that the whole thing is a part of a geopolitical construct. It's a multi-layered human rights and humanitarian issue. Now why? Because if you look at the, um, the geography of that area, you will see that this has been one of the fault lines of Second World War. This is the place where the Japanese forces met the British forces. And the British forces were supported by Rohingyas. There are stories, there are books written. It's not something we are uh, creating today. So when they, the Japanese forces want to push through to Cox's Bazaar for a warm water port in order to be able to keep the logistic line open, the Rohingyas gave their life to push through and not allow that to happen. And when eventually Second World War came to an end, the British before leaving said that Northern Rakhine is where the Rohingyas should remain in perpetuity. So some people in Myanmar feels that was a major mistake and a crime committed and they have, it has to be rectified. Okay. Did did I did I, did I, did I, did I do? One too far. You passed the last one. I think there are a couple of uh, couple of slides. 
See, I get carried away with the Cold War period. <laughs> okay. Now, um, <laughs> because, <laughs> okay. Now, what is the expectation of Bangladesh? Because often we are asked, I'm sure there will be questions. First is that, you know, our, our question is, you know, return, of course, and uh, we'll see when and how it happens. The question is, make someone accountable for the atrocities that has been committed, and uh, 20,000 dead. Uh, women's violated. Uh, I, was, uh, I was there in the camp on 23rd of uh, August, and I continue to remain there. Uh, some of our colleagues were, uh, were visiting uh, Cox's Bazaar. Uh, we have seen women telling our women colleagues that uh, she has been raped 19 times in three days. So this is what we are talking about. So isn't the world uh, make sure that somebody is accountable for this. If uh, it fails to do that, uh, I think uh, there will be much more incidents like this. A phenomenon, it will become a phenomenon. And that's what we see now with, with, the, with the Buddhist Rakhines, <coughs> this is happening. Not only with the Muslim uh, Rohingyas. Address root causes. You know, why the hell in 1982 passports were taken out when Rohingyas when, the, uh, when uh, Myanmar came into, uh, in, into its own independence uh, in 1948, there were ministers from uh, uh, the Rakhine Committee, the members of the parliaments from the Rakhine Committee. So what has gone wrong and that their passports were uh, taken away by the military in 1982 and given a white card and a blue card and a red card? All kinds of cards floats around in Myanmar. As if you are not a human being, you are a, you are a card. Okay. Uh, so that's something need to be looked at. And in, in the Kofi Annan Commission report, this has been dealt. The full, the full chapter uh, under the pathway of, uh, of citizenship. Uh, and, and we are not asking too much. Whatever we agreed, both the countries, let's make a conducive environment for the Rohingyas to go back. And uh, if it doesn't happen, it looks like it's highly unlikely to happen. Create a safe zone for them. And, uh, and that's where uh, we are currently uh, focusing. We have made the proposal yesterday to the Security Council. I know it will not happen today. But who knows? Maybe, maybe my uh, grandchildren will end up uh, doing something if I'm not able to do anything. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. That was uh, a highly in engaging um, talk and quite different from the conversation that we had uh, last year, I think. Um, and um, I, I, uh, I s mentioned in my, in my opening remarks that I think that the, the crisis right now demands a, a, a two-pronged approach. One is, of course, is much of what you spoke about is the need to uh, resolve the crisis in Rakhine State to create the conditions for a safe, voluntary, um, and dignified return, but recognizing that that is going to take time to also not uh, take our eyes off the ball of, of, uh, of meeting the needs, the long-term needs of the, of the uh, refugees and the host communities. So I want to ask you one brief question on, on each of those, if you don't mind, uh, before we open up the floor. Um, at, uh, at IPI, we've been conducting uh, a fair amount of work. We have a dedicated program on humanitarian affairs uh, uh, run by my colleague over there, Alice DeBerre. Um, and we've been working on uh, the challenges of delivering health care in crisis responses. And we recently published a report on the humanitarian response in Myanmar, uh, delivering health care in crisis. Last year, when you were here, uh, uh, and I, I remembered this, this stuck out in my head, but I also did go back and, and, and watch your presentation. But you, you noted the high percentage of women and children amongst the, amongst the refugees in Cox Bazaar. Um, and they, of course, have very particular uh, needs. 
mm -hmm. health care needs, education, um, uh, including mental health, mm -hmm. sexual and reproductive health needs. Could you talk a bit about the current state of the health responses in the, in the refugee camps and um, what is being done, the challenges being met, the uh, role of the international community and the like? Good. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. I think um, I, I remember when uh, uh, these uh, ringers were walking across the border, you know, most of them actually roughly about 400 to 450,000 came in in the first two weeks. So there was a large number of people walking into an area where there was no infrastructure. Literally, it was a deep forest, yeah? elephant's habitat. That it used to be where you see the camp right now. No health structure, no infrastructure, no um, f kind of a market system even to buy some certain things. And one of the most uh, challenging uh, situation that we were confronted with, uh, not with shelter, not with food, but with health. Mm. And uh, the fear was that there will be, a, and we, those of us who worked in the emergencies, we know we call crisis within a crisis. So health is a area which often creates a crisis within a crisis. And you know, to, thanks to the people of Bangladesh, uh, who literally hosted this, uh, incoming ringers, uh, thanks to uh, local NGOs, till uh, um, the uh, UN system. In those days, if I remember, only IOM and UNICEF World Food Program were there because of the 300,000 ringers that, that they were, only for the 300,000. So they were also uh, uh, not very sure to how to manage it, but uh, you know, in our part of the world, uh, we often believe that Allah helps, uh, Allah resolves uh, when no one can uh, help you out. So I think Allah was very generous helping us to, it, it may sound very ridiculous to some of our colleagues, <laughs> but believe me, uh, uh, we, 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 we didn't know uh, how we will address, so uh, our Prime Minister asked the military to go down. Now that created another problem, set of problem. And anyone tell me what kind of a problem one would face to see military uh, walking in to help uh, uh, health issues of Rohingyas? Because anyone guess? <laughs> the women started running because it's the same dress, same kind of a weapon that our military was carrying. Uh, so they started running. And it took two, three days to make them understand this is not Myanmar military. This is, they are not going to kill you, but they are going to help you. So we, then the prime minister decided, get the women military to go. We have a large women contingent. Uh, so w women forces led the health operation. Mm. And then came in WHO others. In the process, for the first time, we had a, 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 what you call bro uh, diphtheria, diphtheria breakout. And we, uh, Bangladesh, is, 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 there's no single case of diphtheria. We didn't have the vaccination to start with. So it took WHO to flu uh, and vaccines for about three to four days. Uh, so those, those were kind of a things, but now it is much more structured. If you go now, you'll see there are at least three million, uh, the government run hospitals, uh, a, a, which has further been uh, uh, upgraded. There are also uh, uh, hospitals run by uh, Turkish government, Malaysian government, uh, uh, med medicine with, without uh, doctors without borders, and uh, who else? WHO. So now the health issue has been resolved. Thanks God and that World Bank has come out with a fairly large pot of money uh, uh, to continue to uh, provide health services uh, to to the Rohingyas and to the local communities. Now they realize that you cannot only serve the Rohingyas and not the local community. So it's for everybody. I've, I've gone myself uh, to the Doctors Without Frontiers uh, unnoticed to see whether the hospital is only for Rohingyas or for everybody. And I was very pleasantly surprised to see that it was open for everybody. They didn't ask where you are coming, what is your nationality, are you from the other side of the border or are you living here? Whoever can, they, they continue to provide services. There are other also smaller NGOs providing in their own capacity health. I think health sector has been extremely, uh, extremely nicely uh, taken care of. And now with the World Bank resources, I think it, it, will be, it will be much easier. But initially it was Bangladesh 
government, Bangladesh military, which provided health services to them. Now, there are a large number of pregnant women who came back, and those who have worked there, they know what I mean, have children in a particular week. Uh, there are 45,000 children, new children, large number of them. And some of these children are born out of conflict. And, uh, and you understand, uh, these are very conservative people. Uh, and uh, what uh, creates, what condition creates in their life when they have a children, and nobody knows who is the father. So that is something I think Myanmar needs to look at. And this is what we are also getting ICC and other to look at, that these are war children. And we know what war children means. In 71, we had war children. Some of them are coming back to Bangladesh now, after 40, 47, 48 years. And they are, go they are going to, to the places uh, where they think their parents were, mother. And it's, a, it's a pathetic. So what I'm suggesting that this, this phenomena will come back and haunt some of the people on the other side even after 50 years. Mm. Right. Sorry for being little. Uh... No, that's great. That's a <laughs> lot of important detail. Very, very great. Um, so then, then I wanted to ask you. Um, I want to ask you a question about really about the concrete next steps in trying to attempt to to resolve uh, these issues. You, you uh, yeah, briefly, health issues. No, uh, turning to the resolving of the crisis. Uh, we talked uh, thinking again in this two-pronged approach, as I see it, we're yes. responding to uh, the humanitarian crisis. And you know, I, I wish I knew. <laughs> but let, let me ask you one <laughs> concretely. You, you, mentioned, <laughs> you, you, um, you mentioned that international pressure is, is critical. You mentioned the uh, possible role of ASEAN in the in yeah. potential safe okay. zones right. and right. Like, yeah. um, the role of the OIC. Is there, is there something on the calendar that Bangladesh is looking to for, the, for a concrete action that could take let place? Me, let me, for the time being, Forget that I represent Bangladesh and, and imagine that I'm on the other side. Mm -hmm. How the Myanmar authorities or my counterpart is looking at it. Mm -hmm. yeah? that's, that, that's how we normally play the game. So <laughs> I'll share with you. Uh, they think it's a question of time. Everybody will be tired, fatigued, and they'll forget. And they're Muslims, so anyway, they're not much sympathy globally. I mean, very frank. So, they think that if you can hang on and manage Bangladesh, especially people like me, uh, if they can manage them, or by the time we retire, new generation may not feel in the same way that some of us feel, uh, the problem will get resolved. And these people will somehow or other disappear in the 160 millions of Bangladeshis. This is what they're thinking. So, so basically for them, it's to buying time. And hiding behind friends. That's something extremely important. In the past, often people ask me, why that you could settle last time, last two occasions, 72, 70, 78, 79, and 91, and 92, and 93, by bilaterally sending them back. And why are you not successful mm. this time? That time, Myanmar, if you remember, was absolutely alone. There was no international support. There was no so-called democracy. Huh? They were under, um, under various kinds of resolutions by ILO, by High Commissioner for Human Rights, by uh, UNSCR, by everybody in fact. So they had no friends. And Bangladesh was the only friend. So they could not uh, annoy us. So they took the bilateral path. They said, it's all right, something grossly has been happened and we, we'll take them back. This time, they have so many friends, so many friends, literally, that they don't need Bangladesh. Hmm. So that's why we're finding it very difficult to bring it to a conclusion. And also, I think you have to understand that Bangladesh, uh, you know, uh, Bangladesh of 70. 879, 91, 92, a Bangladesh today is a different Bangladesh, yeah? uh, in, in every sense of the word, uh, whether it is economically, politically, and also Bangladesh is in, a, in the hand of a different generation. 
the people who are sitting here from the foreign office and other they're different generation in 78 79 the people who are sitting in the same place they are not the same this generation is a different generation yeah. which possibly Myanmar failed to understand yeah. that uh, our sense of rights our sense of justice uh, uh, is much stronger than possibly our previous generation yeah. our previous generation were born and uh, worked uh, for uh, different countries mm. uh, we we were born and working for independent bangladesh mm. we have a different kind of a value system mm. which i think they failed to understand we, they didn't feel that they will pursue the way uh, 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 we are pursuing now so that's also something uh, they are uh, they are struggling to understand uh, right now uh, so prime minister decided to take it to the unga they never thought that it will ever happen because in the past it has never happened so that was a major departure and i think they were caught by surprise things happened in august in september we took it we brought our prime minister decided to bring it to the unga and in the unga she said it's an ethnic cleansing so i don't think they ever could preempt this so that's where they gone wrong coming back to my own mind how we are going to solve it i think it will come to an end but it will need strong will continuous persuasion because it has to there's no alternative otherwise uh, uh, i think uh, uh, we'll end up with a situation which don't i don't want to utter and uh, we don't want to see mm. but i i normally make a joke i just did in uh, this morning i said this time when they go back we will build a wall of 41 km <laughs> big wall we spend we get all our bangladeshi friends together and build a wall so that this myanmar can not push rohingyas next time to bangladesh joking <laughs> no, we don't we don't uh, walls right now we're trying, to, trying to stay away from that topic well let's let's open up the floor i want to sure there's uh, many uh, questions here yes in the in the middle here in the fourth row Uh, there's a microphone and please um, introduce yourself uh, for the webcast please hi there james rinal journalist with al jazeera thanks so much for um uh, talking to us today about this uh, immigration headache you've got um obviously bangladesh has a different immigration headache at the moment in relation to the government of the uk over this isis bride shamima begum um uh they've stripped her of citizenship but i thought she's a british hmm. by by every sense of the word hmm. I mean that's what I'm going to ask you obviously. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to we're going to collect and, a few questions. And, so. and in terms of the detail of it they say that um uh, uh that because she's under the age of 21 in accordance with Bangladesh's um uh citizenship act of 51 that um uh, because she's got uh two Bangladeshi parents that uh according to diplomatic notes between the two governments um she should be given citizenship by you guys. By by Bangladesh. Ah, I see. Uh, yes, right uh, back there. <clears throat> Hi, thank you for that uh, very interesting presentation about your about the Rohingyas. Uh, my name is Manik Mehta. I'm syndicated journalist. Uh, Myanmar happens to be a member of the ASEAN group, and is there something the ASEAN can do to pressurize? Uh, Myanmar into taking back the refugees also uh, there are two countries which have substantial rohingya population and these are Malaysia and Indonesia can they do something substantially more than what they have done now mm -hmm. thank you let's take a, one more up, up here in the front yeah Uh, thank you your excellency uh, Lawrence Moss my, my, my name is Shahid <laughs> uh, Lawrence Moss New York City Bar Association so first admiration to Bangladesh for having accepted nearly a million refugees for not having engaged in forced repatriation and for efforts to pressure Myanmar to accept its responsibilities and hold Myanmar accountable but there's a lot of concern in the human rights and humanitarian community about the construction of a new refugee camp on the island of uh, Basan Char mm. and whether that's suitable for human habitation and under what conditions uh, 
Rohingya might be forced to go there. And yeah. can you guarantee that any any Rohingya movement, so. first of all, will be made safe for habitation under international standards? Secondly, that no Rohingya will be forced to go there unless it's truly voluntary informed consent based on knowledge of the conditions there. There's been talk of a lottery to select Rohingya. That sounds like forced relocation, people chosen by lottery. Can you guarantee that will not be the method? And then there's been conflicting statements from within your government as to whether relocation there will be permanent or temporary, and whether Rohingya who are relocated there will then have the option, if they find it unsuitable, to move back to the mainland of, of Bangladesh. Can you guarantee that there will be freedom of movement back to the mainland of Bangladesh for refugees sent there who find the conditions unsuitable? Yeah. I think those are three good questions for you to, we'll have, hopefully have another round I, of- I took uh, two questions. We are talking about ringers here, no? Yeah. You have your, uh, I'll, I'll stick to okay. two questions and, uh, and keep the first question between the two government. Okay. Um, <laughs> yes, that's your answer. You can, you can see me afterwards, and I'll give you the story. Um, uh, on the on the uh, on the ASEAN uh, issue, as you know, that ASEAN uh, uh, they have, uh, uh, according to the charter, uh, a provision not to interfere in uh, internal matter uh, of each other. So they continue to uh, keep that, and uh, that has helped them to uh, build uh, ASEAN the way they have uh, built. Uh, but uh, with the chairmanship, uh, but within that, uh, uh, countries like Malaysia, Indonesia to some extent, Brunei uh, uh, have been pretty vocal right, right from right from one. Especially after Mahathir took over, they had issued a long statement, uh, uh, and uh, and um, and after uh, Singapore took over last year, two thousand eighteen, Singapore. Uh, uh, Took a stronger uh, position on uh, uh, on in general human rights issues, but in particular the Rohingya issue. Uh, the Singaporean foreign minister visited uh, Bangladesh, went to the Cox's Bazaar to see for himself as to what that uh, the whole world is talking about. And uh, I we are not member, we are no, not privy, but my colleagues suggested. ASEAN colleagues that uh, Singaporean uh, in their concluding session of the ASEAN summit in November uh, has been uh, pretty vocal and tough on this. Uh, lead up to that, they set up a three member task force to look at the Rohingya issues. So this is what the ASEAN uh, engagement is. We are extremely uh, uh, happy that ASEAN has uh, uh, actually shifted uh, some of its uh, age-old principles and also they have engaged, uh, they have a humanitarian center uh, which uh, normally provides uh, uh, relief uh, for, for particularly for their own region. So they, they, they have sent uh, the AHA, famously known as AHA, AAHA uh, center to Northern Rakhine to assess as to what uh, uh, what is the need uh, of uh, of these people, so at least some movement on the ASEAN center. Uh, how this will go now? The Thailand is the chair uh, on the Vashan Chor. Uh, you know, Bangladesh is a very uh, small, little, tiny country with the population of 160 million people. We are one one of the mostly densely most densely populated country in the world. Eh? When the ambassadors go to uh, present the credential, I say three things to the um, incoming ambassador. Welcome to the hot, humid, and chaotic Bangladesh. <laughs> so you can understand why do I say this. I say this. Uh, so in order to, but Bangladesh is also uh, a, a country where there are 146 islands, small islands. Those islands are habitated by Bangladeshis, fishermen, uh, cattle raisers and all kinds of things. The Vashan Chor currently holds about 86,000 cattle, hmm, different kinds. So it's a very fertile uh, place. There's a, uh, there's a sweet water uh, in the land. Normally that's where the problem lies, if it is in the ocean. So looking at this, we, we thought that let's create alternatives. We know that uh, maybe some eventually will go back 
all will not go back. So we'll have to have a place for them to live. And that was the reason the government decided to create an alternative. Alternative for them, alternative for us. Uh, if uh, the uh, Myanmar, uh, the Rohingyas do not go, possibly some of us will go. We'll in fact, our local people are all excited that if the Rohingyas do not go, then we can go and have our forward location before we go to sea and, and fish. And this is also a place where uh, fish has dried up uh, for, for eventual export. So, and as you have, uh, as a lawyer, you have said, I can assure you, have faith on, uh, on the Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina, have faith on Bangladesh. Uh, you know, if we have uh, ready to sacrifice uh, part of our uh, a meal for the Rohingyas, we will certainly not force them into the sea. Hmm. Right, we'll open the floor again. Uh, yes, Yael here in the front row, or second row there. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, I'm Dr. Daniele <coughs> of the International Organization of Victims Assistance. It's actually wonderful to have a continuing dialogue because we did discuss the health problems last year and in effect you were presenting it in your in your answer as uh, as how ba Bangladesh actually gained from the international help to the refugees in terms of the, the local community also gaining from hospitals for example uh, which is a wonderful model to follow so may I ask you also in terms of education have you found that to be to be uh, helpful to both communities of the refugees and the locals? Uh, because uh, you want to not have another lost generation. I mean, we're looking around the world today, and we we already predicting a whole lot of lost generations. Let me add the long-term uh, perspective, which you raised by talking about the war children who are now returning from two or three wars back. Uh, and we know that, in fact, there are multi-generational effects of traumas and wars and tragedies. Could you expand on that? Because I have a, a distinct feeling that you can actually help others understand uh, more deeply uh, the, because you just said it yourself, which is very helpful. Great, thank you. We'll take a couple more. Uh, yes, we're actually right there and, and then we'll go back to... Hi, I'm David with Save the Children. Thanks uh, first for taking the time to meet with us and David. I want to... So we can Sorry? see you. Uh, yes, <laughs> I wanted to thank um, yeah, the Bangladeshi people for generosity to host one million uh, refugees. I wanted to just complement the question about education and specifically about access to education for adolescents and, and youth, because I understand like only a minority of a very small minority of uh, refugees currently have access to education. So anything that we can do um, as international community, as humanitarian actors to support and work with the Bangladeshi authorities to increase that, uh, that would be great. Thanks. Um, yes, uh, back here. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, thank you. I'm Julia Blackner with Human Rights Watch. Um, I wanted to thank you for this candid conversation and also um, to note in your statement yesterday at the Security Council, you said that Bangladesh would no longer be in a position to accommodate more people from Myanmar. So I wanted to know if you could specify what you mean by this. Um, Bangladesh has generously served as a safe haven for nearly one million Rohingya refugees. And given the conditions in Myanmar that you described, you can understand why such a statement would be concerning. Um, could you commit that the Bangladesh government will not turn back refugees fleeing ethnic cleansing in Myanmar? You are, you are basically wanting me to contradict my statement. <laughs> 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 why not you see that in the field rather than here? Yeah, this is, shall I? Yeah, you can okay. take those two. Uh, on the one issue more round, of yeah. uh, 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 education and laws, in, how, how many of you have been to Cox's Bazaar. Can I see uh, hands? Cox's Bazaar to the to the camps. Uh, I think uh, I think uh, you know, I, I should invite you. Come over and see for yourself uh, what's there. Um, you are absolutely right that education is uh, is very critical uh, for for any uh, uh, group of people, uh, whether whether displaced or not. And no one else can uh, uh, say it boldly than Bangladesh. Eh? Uh, 
because uh, when uh, when we got liberated, uh, we had hardly uh, any liber educated people because we were deprived of a lot of things, including education. And now, now we have reached to a level where I can converse with you in English. Uh, that was uh, that was very difficult in those days because we didn't have a. Uh, uh, we have series of lost generation ourselves. But uh, when it comes to Rohingyas, you know, how many lost generation are we talking about? Uh, and they, when they were in, uh, uh, in northern Rakhine, they were not given any opportunities to educate themselves. So when uh, I, I'm not saying that that should justify not continuing that policy. What I am uh, trying to tell you that please point this thing out to the Myanmar government that you have absolutely failed as a state to provide education facilities to part of your own populations. And that is possibly one of the reasons that currently you are facing that what you are facing. So I think I will also encourage you to point that out. Somebody should do a study that how Myanmar treats its minorities in terms of providing um, education facilities. So, so I just wanted to say this so that you keep this in mind. Coming back to Bangladesh, when they came in, uh, we had uh, deliberated on uh, on these issues, health, uh, not shelter much because shelter was coming out anyway nicely, uh, sanitation and education. We have now in the camps, that's why I said how many of you have been to the camp, uh, there are uh, centers for, uh, uh, for informal educations and we have said that uh, you know, we expect that they quickly go back to their own uh, own country, uh, uh, and uh, if not, then we will look at uh, uh, education. In fact, the World Bank has uh, come out with uh, a new proposal, which we are currently looking at. You must also appreciate that this is a very difficult decision for a for a government. The government, which is saying that these are our temporary guests, they should be able to go back to their own country, and you know before. Uh, we put a period when we say, you know, we are going to give them education also. So it, it doesn't go along with the international community is not sure as to which, what that we want. Mm. Is it just a rhetoric that we are saying that they should go back to their own homeland or uh, the uh, other thing? So, you know, you have to bear, uh, you know, you have to bear with us for a while and see what we actually do on the ground rather than what we say. The same, same question goes... Uh, uh, to the lady who is the back who happened to be in Cox's Bazaar uh, in the uh, in the past, uh, yeah, I, I think you have to understand. That's what I said that it is a geopolitical construct. You know, in, I I always said, and I think I remember last time also saying that this is a multi-dimensional problem and it's a multi-layered problem. Some of the people asked me in those days, "What do you mean by multi-layered?" I said there's only one layer that you see right now because there is a long game that Myanmar is playing. And, and you'll see other layers. The other layers are gradually now appearing because they, they have a bigger geopolitical game behind sending this Rohingya. That was just first phase. And the mo moment they realize they can get away with it and it's fait accompli, they will have other games. That's why now they are after Arakan army, now they are with other ethnic communities. There are 138 ethnic communities. And some of the communities are actually living along Bangladesh and Myanmar uh, border. And part of those communities, same ethnic population, are also living on the other our side of the border. They are relatives, close relatives, ethnically same, religiously same. So it's quite a, quite a bombshell. So it is very easy to say, you know, Bangladesh has been giving shelter to these fighters. Who knows who is married to whom? Yeah? Somebody raised about British, I don't want to remember that. But when you divided the border, you know, nobody thought of it that in 60, 70 years time, this will become a complex problem. We have solved one problem, and I'll mention that. Within Bangladesh and within India, there were principalities before uh, British divided uh, uh, Bengal. And these principalities remained principalities till 2016, 
when Bangladesh and India, through a peaceful negotiations, settled citizenship of 61,000 stateless people. They were people who were living in Bangladesh, surrounded by Bangladesh territory, not having any citizenship, and vice versa. That's what, after 62 years, we settled it between Bangladesh and India. We said, whoever wants to stay in Bangladesh, you'll, on 31st July 2016, if you don't leave or express your desire, you are a Bangladeshi, and vice versa. Most of the people decided to stay, and now there is no principality. There were, I think, I don't know how many, maybe 31 principality on both sides, or 135. So, so these are the complex, what I call partition politics. We have similar partition situations between us and Myanmar. So when that partition, just opposed by ethnic composition, it becomes a hot cocktail. And that's what uh, I think we in the region have to understand. If you fail to understand, we will have a different game. People even forget that there were Rohingyas who crossed over. There will be different conflict and different issues internationally. That's what I told the Security Council yesterday. Don't see this as a humanitarian issue. It's a human rights issue. If you don't settle it, it will be a geopolitical issue. Just wait and see. Great, thank you. Did I answer? Yeah. <laughs> uh, we, we, have, we have time for a couple more questions. If, uh, if there's a, uh, Yes, here in the front. Talal Fassam, uh, Kuwait Mission. Uh, Mr. Secretary, always a pleasure to see you here in New York. I had the opportunity to pleasure. sit uh, in a few meetings when I was in Dhaka and Cox Bazaar with you. Um, I wanted to ask for your opinion on uh, a few discussions that are taking place, such as brainstorming, actually. Um, first of all, the idea of maybe having a roadmap uh, to the solution on Myanmar, considering that the Kofi Annan uh, recommendations are 88 points and we are running around in circles trying to implement all 88 and which ones are the priorities. Um, and then going from there, from, from, uh, from a, a roadmap, um, there are two opinions on this. First of all, the core of the issue is the citizenship issue and the 1982 citizenship law, uh, which excludes uh, many races in Myanmar, of course. To tackle this issue is to uh, talk about the citizenship law and amending it before we talk about anything else. And that will, the basis of that is because once you offer the citizenship to the Rohingya and to other minorities, that will start the repatriation process easily because all the refugees will know they are citizenships now and they can go back home. Mm -hmm. The other point is, from this uh, roadmap, is that we start the repatriation and not going into the temporary camps that are being uh, built in Myanmar. We go step by step from one village to the other and then we bring the families into those village offer them safe haven back to their original place. So what are your thoughts on that, Mr. Secretary? Okay. Could take one, uh, one more question, if there's one more question. If not, I think the roadmap is actually an excellent way yeah, to, uh, yeah. to conclude. Um, no, thank you very much. It's, it's good to see friends uh, in the room. Uh, not that Anderson. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, absolutely, I, I think the ultimate answer is citizenship. Now, uh, the Kofi Annan Commission report suggested that there should be a pathway to citizenship. So you start the process, and then eventually you, you get what you were taken away uh, from you in 1982. This will only happen uh, with the Security Council resolution. Myanmar is not going to listen to anything else other than punitive action on the part of uh, UN. Whether UN is ready for that, I, I don't know. Uh, as we read, uh, as they read us, we also read them. And, uh, uh, and uh, they think it's a question of time. People will forget. 
if not forgive uh, what they did and uh, nobody will care about uh, citizenship of uh, of 1.2 or 1.8 million rohingyas so that's the uh, citizenship issues it will not come automatic it will not come through dialectical persuasion it will only come through strong punitive action on the part of security council period on the issue of a village actually that's what our safe uh, uh, safe zone uh, is intended for uh, i i have uh, been to northern rakhine now three times and flown over by the myanmar uh, helicopter uh, and seen the vast fertile land uh, in the northern rakhine currently there was no one uh, to cultivate or, uh, uh, or do anything now that is the reason that we said that could we have uh, villages couple of villages and in between corridor safe corridor and then another village another group of village and then another group of village where uh, without segregating them whether they could live together with the currently there is no one so unless myanmar brings in people and gets them settled uh, uh, which is also highly unlikely because they don't have too many people willing to come and uh, live there except foreigners um i haven't said this okay uh, now and then uh, hypothetically i also suggested that corridor should extend up to bangladesh border so if at any stage of time these people feel again threatened killed tortured they can come back they can come back so uh, that i am not saying it here uh, this is not official is just our thinking just to give them a sense of security that this remains your place go back and try out your own ancestral home and if you think that it's no longer safe and the military comes and kills you again you can come back to so this is what we are thinking but when you are asking road map i think eventually there could be or must be a peacekeeping operation hmm. otherwise i don't see uh, resolution of of this uh, of this problem Uh, there was another uh, issue that often comes up and Myanmar suggests that Bangladesh is doing a very good business. Uh, their foreign secretary is going all over the world and making speeches, becoming a star. Uh, they are getting all kinds of aids and, and, and business. Absolutely rubbish. Uh, we were supposed to uh, make uh, 8.5% growth rate last year. All set. Uh, we couldn't. One percent GDP has been pulled down because of presence of Rohingyas. It's a it's a devastating experience on our economy, our on our social fabric. All the schools of this of that region is closed. Those who have been to Cox's Bazar, you know. Uh, forest gone, elephants gone. They're all going to many direction except the place where they used to live. Can you imagine how Bangladesh would be able to? recreate the deep forest possibly never in a, in a large vast of a of an area which is which, which used to be one of our uh, important place for ter- uh, for uh, for tourism cox's bazar is has, used to be known as a tourist uh, district is is no longer the case so it is more of a un and uh, ingo town rather than a <laughs> rather than a t- t- touristic town no i'm joking uh, so so that that said uh, that's what has happened to us uh, over the years so the only reason that we possibly uh, hear this burden is because uh, this is exactly what has happened to us in 1971 10 million of us crossed over uh, to india so that continues to uh, inspire us uh, that gives us uh, the motivation to repay back to the humanity 
which saved us. And in one of the meetings of Prime Minister, I remember saying, you know, people were not very uh, sure as to if the border is open and how many people will come and what will. And everybody knew this will be very difficult adventure. He said, if India wouldn't have opened border in 1971, some of you would, have, would not be here. So everybody became very quiet. All of a sudden realized that this is what happens when people fail to get shelter expelled by their own people. Hmm. Well, <laughs> uh, thank you. I mean, uh, really, Mr. Secretary, thank you so much for these really frank remarks and, and keen historic insights. I mean, a takeaway that I would say that uh, continues to develop in my mind is that this really is. Um, as you say, uh, a multi-dimensional, multi-layered, multi-generational uh, uh, crisis. Your historic insight is particularly uh, noteworthy to me. I mean, it's a, it really is a long-term problem with uh, uh, very urgent short-term demands, but a need, need for a long-term perspective on both the history and the, and the resolution. It seems to me that in some ways it's a, it's a real good case for uh, what we're calling in this neighborhood the triple nexus of a crisis that is both the peace and security, development, and human rights all in one, which makes it very complicated, but also sort of in some sense maps out uh, what kind of pro uh, process needs to um, be engaged in for a resolution of some kind. Um, and I take your point very uh, keenly that you know, this is not just a humanitarian crisis, human, human rights crisis, it can be a geopolitical crisis, and therefore it really demands our attention and it will be, uh, remain in our, on our, uh, in our perspective for some time. So uh, thank you again for coming, we really appreciate it.